So I love catering because it is um, free, free marketing, free advertising for your restaurant, and it's highly profitable. Um, and it makes the difference between owning a job and owning a business. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, job is a four-letter word. And I always want to have whatever business I'm in be able to support me and not me required to kill myself. I mean, it, it takes work in the beginning in any business, but you want to get at a point that you could put somebody else in to run your day-to-day -day operations and you're not a slave to your business. And catering gives you those extra profits. Um, here are some of the um, groups that I've, I've sp spoke for. I've been at Pizza Expo multiple times. Um, the National Restaurant Association, I've spoken for just about all the major food distributors. I've written for all the trade publications and consulted for Domino's Pizza. So um, this isn't my first time around the block and I've got a lot of really great ideas to share with you. I've written a book called Cater or Die and Catering Multipliers. If you want a free copy of the book, um, I would um, suggest you stay to the end. I'm gonna show you how to get that. Um, why, are you, why are you here today? So we're gonna cover three ideas. Number one, how to create a money-making menu, because I've seen my share of really terrible catering menus. Um, number two, how to get new catering clients. And number three, which people don't spend enough time on, is how to get repeat catering clients, how to get them to come back, because you'll never get rich off one-time clients unless all you do is high-end weddings. And even then, you really want them to come back because half of them are gonna get divorced, so you want the second wedding. Might not be as high of a check average, but it's still incremental sales. Um, says the man who's been divorced twice. So, creating the perfect catering menu. Most catering menus I see look like a um, calculus equation. Very confusing. So, um, how many how many of y'all have menus that are like you sell half pans and full pans of pasta? Okay. How many people do per person pricing? Okay. So the challenge with half pans and full pans: if a half pan feeds ten, a full pan feeds twenty, what are you going to do when someone has fifteen people? Huh? So you're going to sell them thirty three percent more? I have to pay 33% more because you don't have it packaged for what I need? I'm being facetious, but, huh? The way we have it is it says um, full pan at 15 to 20, and a half pan at 8 to 10. Oh, okay. So you just kind of put them on it. Yeah. That's only on the restaurant level, but we own a catering company that we sell per person. Right. So when you do a half pan or a full pan, you're, you're locking them in that every single time they're either going to have too little, too much, or sometimes they're gonna have just enough, and the price is always different, right? So if you need an extra, if you need to bump up to that full pan for 15, because you don't have three quarters of a pan, in theory, then I'm paying a premium, 33% more, so now it could be as low as $8 a person, it could be $13 a person, so there's no consistency. And um, so if it was in increments of 20, it'd be easy, right? Give me a full pan of salad, give me a full pan of pasta, give me 20 breadsticks, what have you. But then if somebody says, well, now I want two entrees instead of one, that muckies up the equation because you can't take, for 20 people, you really can't do a pan of 10 and a pan of 10 because you know people are going to want a little bit of both, so you really need food for 25 or 30. So this becomes, we could sit here and just go through this food math and then what ends up happening is only one person knows the formula and it's in their head, it's the owner. So if they're not there to answer the phone or talk to the person, what ends up happening? Nothing happens. And let me tell you, you wanna, you wanna be like the dumbest guy in your business. That's my job is to be dumb. Like, I don't know, go ask somebody else. They know, I just signed the checks, I mean, that's where you want to be. Create the systems so you're not the weakest link. Because we were talking about you're going down to Florida. What if you're the only person who knows all the formula for full pans and half pans? Well, here you are on vacation, and you're having to take calls on how to do things. 
It's not a good position to be in. The other thing is, people are looking, they're not buying food from you. I know we're all foodies, and we can talk about all the great places we've eaten here or all over the world. You know, we, we, we fall asleep with food TV in the background. I get it. But a catering client doesn't care about the food as much as I need you to take care of my guests. So if I have 12 guests, I want to know there's enough food for 12. You're not going to run out. You're going to show up on time. That's what's important. Doesn't matter how great your food is. If you show up late or, you know, I'm overpaying one time, run out of food the next. So what we have worked with our clients on, and this is an old menu, is a per person pricing. That's really the way to go. Now, a lot of you are going, well, Michael, what do I do with the pans? Well, build that into the cost that you're gonna send out a half pan, you could send out a full pan, and you could send out a three-quarter full pan, and then figure out a matrix that says, based on this many people, this is what I'm sending out, and send out a little bit more, but build it in. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Maybe just a, oh. Uh, yeah, I didn't put, I don't have much to mess with, so we're good. So you wanna do, um, we'll talk about three-tier pricing, but you wanna do per person, because it's super simple. Can, we were, like I'd mentioned before, of our million dollars a year in catering, we have chairs up here if you wanna sit. These people don't bite. And uh, you wanna stay to the end, because we're gonna have fireworks and a special guest singer. So it's, it's gonna be the best thing of the show. Um, so, when we did most of our catering was just drop off packages, you know, 10, 20, 30 people, our hostesses could take those orders, right? Because how, di how difficult is it to say, here are three packages, here are three prices, how many people do you want? And what, what choices do you want? What pizza do you want? What pasta do you want? What dressing do you want on your salad? You know, you could train anybody to take a drop off catering order. Um, Here's um, a client in Nashville. We designed their menu. Um, we put together four packages for them. Um, and we'll talk about some of the components. Here's another client. Here's another one. So definitely big into per person pricing. Um, I'd probably stick between three and four, maybe five packages, depending on your, your offering. Like somebody had said, I think you said you do sandwiches and pasta and pizza. Did you say one more? And wings. Um, so those are some different menus that we've designed for people. So let's talk about um, catering menu basics, some things to keep in mind, the famous factor. You, you got a pizzeria, you got an Italian restaurant, don't serve Chinese food. Like we were talking about him starting a, you know, he's Sicilian, all these great Italian recipes, but I can also do fajitas. Well, do you want to get a fajita bar from your Italian restaurant or you want to get it from your favorite Mexican restaurant? So that's an advantage you have is the fact that you're known for your great pizza, pasta, salads, sell, sell what you're known for. Plus you have inventory advantages, you're already stocking the food anyway, so it's not like a caterer that has to go out and specially um, order um, inventory items and worry about you know, I got. I only need three quarters of case of something. Um, everything's gonna not go to waste because you can use it in your restaurant. Packages. Um, I'm a big believer in good, better, best. We have three types of buyers. Psychological. We have the cheap client. How many people deal with that? I'm on a budget. I've got a budget. I got to stick to. Then we've got the uh, what I call the ego client. They'll spend all the money you give them an opportunity to spend. Um, and then we have the, the safe, medium. I don't, would you tell them I'll call them back? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so you want to um, have something for every price point. Otherwise, you'll leave money on the table. Um, so think about that, low, mid, high price. Um, and when it comes... Uh, to pricing, I don't know if we're gonna, I'll just bring it up now. Do you know how to price a catering menu?
Everybody asks me that. Simple, what the market will bear. So go out and play prospect with your competitors. Order a small drop-off catering, see what you get for the quality, and see where do I fall in line. So let's just take something everybody understands. Everybody understands hamburgers, right? So if you're in the McDonald's, you know that your hamburger is going to be inexpensive, right? Now on the other end, if we went to Morton's Steakhouse and ordered a hamburger for dinner, how much are we going to spend? 20 bucks, right? So we got a, a dollar value menu hamburger here. We got a $20. And if we were going to go to Outback, what would we spend? 10 bucks for a burger, I'm guessing? So 10, 12. So you need to be really real with yourself and say, where do I fall on the price value continuum? If you um, are delusional and you think that your um, pizza is like the primo in town and it's not, you're going to price yourself out of getting any jobs. And if you're primo and you think you need to compete on price, you're not going to make a profit because, you know, you're making your dough from scratch, you're making your sauce, you've got premium ingredients. You can't compete with the guy um, that's got frozen dough skins and, you know, crap ingredients. And there's a market for everybody, but you need to know where you are and then you can decide what to charge based on what other people are charge, charging. Um, I, I did a, a presentation last year where I actually go out and I look at portion size, I weigh portions. You know, something like a sandwich. You know, you might charge $9.99 for a box lunch, someone else charges $7.99, and someone goes, well, I could get this for $2 cheaper, because yeah, we put three ounces of turkey on our sandwich versus two. We give you 33% 30 more um, meat on the sandwich. So that's why you're paying more. So you need to understand what your competitors are doing and what makes you stand out. Um, you never want to go apples to apples with anybody. You want to go apples to oranges and have another enough point of di differentiation. Add-ons. I don't believe in building in the cost of drinks and desserts into the package. Um, because when you're putting out a flyer and you have your three prices, that's what's going to get the phone to ring, is your price point. And then when you have them on the phone, would you like to order chocolate chip cookies? Would you like to order brownies? Would you like to order cheesecake bites? Would you like to get um, drinks and desserts? Um, one, one of the, I'm going to send you where you can get one of my books. I talk about how to package drinks. How many people sell drinks by the gallon? How many do it per person? And I guess a lot, most of you just don't offer drinks. So you want to do per person on the drinks. It's easier to sell, better value. I've written a whole book that you can get for free about how to price it. And you'll make probably two to 300% more profit doing it that way than selling it by the gallon. Um, testimonials. Um, if you've done a good job, you should have clients that will give you testimonials. And then the higher profile the testimonial, the better. So you want to use those on your marketing materials. You want to use them on the back of your menus. So like in Nashville, Vanderbilt University, everybody knows. Nissan Motor, everybody knows. Bridgestone Firestone, Grand Ole Opry. If you've catered for some high profile people in your community, you ask them to give you um, a testimonial. Could y'all do me a favor? Would y'all mind shutting the door um, so we can... Um, not have the thank you so much. Um, testimony, yes. Um, good point, but um, in San Diego, for some reason, a lot of the corporations don't need to get it out. Companies just don't need to put it in. And I don't want to put it in. You know, they just use their uh, first name, and that's it. And a couple of them call it, and that's, that's their policy. So, what's your name? Rob. Rob. Um, when you go out and sell, does anybody close 100%? Okay. If you can get one out of 10 of those high profile to give you a testimonial, there's still high profile testimonials. So I focus on who I can get, not who I can't get. So I, I appreciate that, but that's not going to keep me from finding somebody, whether it's a pharmaceutical war, rep who works for Pfizer. You know, there's enough high profile clients in your community 
um, whether it's a private school that everybody knows of, somebody, you know, the higher the profile, the better, better off you are. You know, you don't want to put great party Michael A. Who knows Michael A., you know? You don't even know Michael Atias by show of hands, so you wouldn't even want me as a testimonial. Um, guarantees, does anybody offer a guarantee on their catering? I'm gonna highly recommend you do. So when I, when I started off, we did the 120% guarantee. We did all you can eat, barbecue buffets. If we ran out of food, we'll give you your money back and 20% credit on your next event, which um, help us get a lot of events because what happens if you run out of food at a company event? You're gonna be embarrassed, right? Guess how often I had to make good on that guarantee? Zero. Because if you're a good caterer, you're not gonna run out of food based on what they guarantee and the type of crowd they have, right? So that's your job is to find out are you feeding football players or blue-haired women in the garden club to know how much to bring out. So the guarantee is based on what they guarantee, not on, hey, whoever shows up. You know, you guarantee 100 people, those 100 people are gonna be fed. You, 120 people show up, bets off. The other thing that I've got my clients doing is an on-time or free um, guarantee on delivery. And people, how many people would do that? If the food's late, I'll give you your money back. Raise your hand. Oh. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, why wouldn't you do that? Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, um, there's a thing called ways that you can work backwards to figure out. And, and, and I'm not picking on you. What I'm saying is, if you show up late consistently, are you going to have repeat business? So the condition of being in the catering business is you're going to show up on time and have it ready when you're supposed to. So if you need to, let's just say you're in a, in a city, Houston, bad traffic, right? They want it set up at 12. You shoot to have it set up by 1130. And you tell them, we're probably going to be 15 to 20 minutes early because we'd rather be early than have it show up late. And then you work backwards. You know, you just adjust your time when you need to leave to get there on time. So, and if you can't be on time, you're not going to be in the catering business because you're going to embarrass the people who hire you and they can't afford to be embarrassed when the CEO's got a meeting with a big client and food's not served on time. So if you're going to be on time anyway, why not guarantee it and use it as a marketing advantage to help you get more clients? Because everybody has had a caterer who's shown up late. And if you have to make a guarantee, you know, if you have to give somebody a, a free meal every now and then, you'll more than make up with it. Think about Domino's Pizza. Two stoners in Michigan decided that they were going to deliver pizza hot, fresh in 30 minutes. Would we know Domino's if they said, hey, you know, we'll get, we'll get it there when we get it there, if that was their logo? <laughs> that was their saying? I, I don't think we would know who Tom Monahan was in Domino's. What about if you had to get a letter to New York City tomorrow morning, super important, who would you use? Uh, of course, somebody's saying, like, post office or something. It's FedEx. Absolutely positive. I grew up in Memphis. That whole company was based on the fact that if it's important enough that I need it there in the morning, they're the only people I'm going to trust. And they guaranteed it. And that's why there's a FedEx. Otherwise, if it's, we think it's going to be there in the morning, but hey, we're all rolling the dice. We're all in this together. Then we just go to the post office and... You know, do we have any postal employees? Because I don't want to piss anybody off. We got one? I love the postal service. Yeah. I didn't see any metal detectors on the way in, so I'm not, I'm not risking it. I'm not feeling that lucky. It's not just about the food. We talked about, you know, making sure that um, you have plenty of portions. Y'all don't have to really take, I'm going to give you a copy of the book that has all this in it. So you don't really need to pay attention to what I'm saying instead of snapping, unless you just are snap happy. And if you want a selfie, I'll take one with you later. Um, it's not just about the food. Last minute ordering is really big. I did a lot of business because people, who are these people wake up at eight o'clock, realize they got 25 people to feed at 11. I, I don't know, drives me crazy. And, um, and then terms, we used to do house charges. How many people, do house charges, they'll bill their clients. 
That's a really big opportunity. We had 25,000 a month in outstanding receivables on a million in business. And you think about it, the reason big corporations like it, it's like, send me a bill and I'll send it to accounting. Now, a lot of you are going, well, they don't pay in 30 days, they pay 60, they pay 90. Let's do the math. Um, what can you borrow money at line of credit? 6%, 7 8%? What are you paying to process a credit card? Two and a half, three percent, let's just say three. Well, that means you could borrow that money for six months before you have to break even for lending it out. And it's gonna help you get more business. Now, I wouldn't give the credit to just anybody, like Michael A doesn't deserve credit, but you know, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals probably does. Um, but it was a big selling point for us. In in all the years, 14 years I had the restaurant, I maybe got taken in the cleaners for a thousand bucks. Now, I didn't give everybody credit, but that's that's pretty, in collection circles, that's like unheard of. And we didn't have to crack any kneecaps or do anything crazy. Okay, where where, where do you want to start promoting um, your catering? Four Walls Marketing is the, the simplest way to get started. Table tents. Um, everybody, if you, if you put table tents on your tables, let people know you cater. Um, and you want multiple zones. Um, and here's a couple of examples. Um, washroom signs, you got a captive audience. They ain't going anywhere. Might as well advertise to them. Back of the stall door. Um, you know, any time you can drip that message, we cater, we cater, we cater, then when they're ready, they remember you. Um, and here's some examples of washroom signs. Flyers and box toppers. You know, even if you're promoting other things in your restaurant, always have something about catering, promoting your cater. Because there's probably a lot of catering opportunities you're not getting because your customers don't realize you cater, right? And so you just have to educate them so when they're ready or there's an opportunity, they think, oh, so-and-so caters. Here's some examples. Buttons for staff, if you would have your staff wear buttons, you could create buttons about um, look like a hero, ask me how, how can I look like a hero? Um, we do catering and we specialize in corporate catering and we'll handle all the details, we'll make you look good. Lobby displays, this is the best catering lobby display I've ever seen in my life. Um, Chick-fil-A, um, they took plastic catering trays and they had four color photography taken of a tray and so it's just a picture. So by putting we cater on a sign, it's better than nothing. And then if you put a picture of catering on the sign or banner, it's good. But when you display the food to look like a catering, so you could do this yourself. You could do trays. You could do aluminum pans and set them up in disposable shafers and have like a pan of pasta. You could take a pizza box and take a cut out of a pizza and put it in there and have that as a display in your lobby with menus um, and it's a great thing. Now one of the things that um, we teach our clients to do is what's called a catering giveaway. It's not a, first of all, I'm not in the legal and accounting business, so I don't know what's legal and right in your town, so please don't come back and knock on my door and say I got in trouble. With that being said, I like to do giveaways versus a drawing. You know what the difference is? A drawing means one person's win winning. A giveaway means I'm gonna give it away to whoever I wanna give it away to. So you wanna give away a free drop-off catering for 10 people. And how many people have something, put your card in a fishbowl and win a catering? Okay, I hate, I hate business cards. You know why? You, can, you don't know who's qualified. How big a company, how many employees, how often do they order? So I have people fill out a form. And so on the form, it'll ask, who are you, what's your title, where do you work, how many, how many people at your, your location, who's responsible for ordering catering, and um, how often is your company ordering catering? So if I get a guy from the State Farm office that has two employees and he doesn't order catering, is he winning the giveaway? Now I have the head of HR for a 500 person company and they order in two, three, four times a month. Um, do they win? Congratulations, you've won. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. Put on your Ed McMahon mask and walk in the door and 
have that. You know what's sad? There's probably 20% of the room who does not know who Ed McMahon is. <laughs> okay, how many people know what the yellow pages are? This is really, wow. Got 25% don't know that. Um, email signatures, we all use email. Why not get a graphic to put at the bottom of your emails? Yes, we cater. Um, make sure when you're emailing your house list, which I see a lot of people don't email their list at all. They don't email their, their takeout dining room list. They don't have a list for their catering customers. That's like the lowest hanging fruit you can get. I've got lots of clients that they send out emails every single month and um, you know, just staying in front of your clients. So, but if you're sending out an email promotion to promote your restaurant or delivery or takeout, put in a tag about catering and then strategically certain times of the year promote catering. Super Bowl, office parties, um, graduation parties is huge. We'll talk about some of that stuff. Um, a website. Um, your website is a virtual retail store. So the question is, if I were gonna pull, put out, uh, pull up your website in front of everybody, um, does it look like an old Kmart shopping center? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, let's give that my, man a prize. Um, or does it look like a brand new Target, right? And so um, perception is everything, right? So if the first thing that I see, I do a Google search for Italian catering or pizza catering, and I come to a website that looks like the one on the left, you know, and this guy probably still has a MySpace account. Um, are you really going to want to use them? And, and yeah, 10% of people don't know what MySpace is either. <laughs> Back in the day, I used to take my electric car 10 miles uphill both ways. Um, or something a little more modern and with it. So you want to um, you want to make sure you have something modern, hip. You want to showcase things like pictures, your menus, your guarantee, testimonials. Um, you want to offer online ordering is really big. Forget for your takeout, you should have that, but also um, for uh, your catering, um, because a lot of people in an office environment just want to go out. We're not talking about a full service event like a wedding or where you're going to set it up, serve and clean up. There's too many questions and moving parts. But for somebody to do a drop-off package, they should just be able to go online and, and place that. Um, any questions? This is a good... Yep. Yep. Why wouldn't you? And have a minimum. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, okay, so. Uh, marketing is more psychology than anything else, right? You tell me $250, I'm going to go, why are you charging me $250, right? I got 1,000 people. So what we did is we had tiered pricing based on the number of people. So it was basically, let's just say, it's what's the minimum number of people that you want to roll that truck out for? Okay, this isn't a compound algebraic equation. Just, to, you know, roughly... Okay, let's just say 50 is your minimum, right? Forget the 250 fee. What do you what do you charge for 50? Okay, so maybe you start out at $19 a person, right? And you explain, look, we're not just dropping off pizza and cardboard boxes. We're going to come out there and set up the the booth. You're going to have a show. We're going to do all this, and you have pictures, and you explain it's $19, and go, well, I only have 80 people. Well, that's fine. It's still $1,900. I mean, nine. A hundred times, yeah, it's, it's, it's $1,900 for us to come out. So you need to know what your minimum that it's worth for you doing and then divide it by the number of people 
And that's what they're paying for. So some, sometimes I had events for 80, and if they wanted us to come out, they were going to pay for 100, right? Because you're not going to roll out to come to my house to feed five people. If I give you the 250 fee, it's not worth it. So there's a, there's a price that you say, look, if I can generate 1,500 in sales, it's worth me rolling. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Does that make sense? And there's plenty of weddings, corporate events that you can stay busy, right? So just focus on the people that you're a good fit for, and the other people will appreciate the fact that that's how you operate, and then when they have an event that's larger, maybe they'll hire you. Yes? Right. Nobody ever minds paying it. And then we always put the optional concessions in this area where we say, hey, we can give you a hundred percent of the pay. It always says suggestions, always say eight percent every time. And then we just have a minimum. And if you go below our minimum, people are are you know, I'll say we can eat eight points and still okay, so we can go by minimum fifty. Then we go by day of the week and then we tier it. My question to you though is well, what kind of margin on your catering versus God, I haven't had a restaurant forever, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what we did. Roughly on drop-off catering, the gross profit was probably 60%, right? And you go, oh, well, you got a 40% food and paper cost. That's a lot. But it's incremental sales. It's all getting made when we're not busy and shipped out. So the restaurant took care of all the overhead, took care of all the staff and everything, and made us a fair profit. That extra catering was was incremental profit that was huge, and it was free marketing. On the full service events, we might have a, we might have had a twenty percent food cost because you need more labor, right? So you know, again, I don't work off margin. I, I work off what the market will bear. So let's just say, where are you based out of? San Diego. San Diego. You've got a wood fired pizza oven. She's got one, and I'm like, dude, I've had I've been to her events. I've been to your events. It's pretty much the same as far as I'm concerned. She's charging 19, you're charging 25. Sorry, I'm going with her. So that's why I say it's what the market will bear. If you're the only guy in town, you can get more because hey, I'm the only guy that does wood-fired pizza oven that'll roll up and if that's what you want at your wedding, that's what you're paying for. You know, in the beginning, in the beginning when people were doing chocolate fountains, hey, I'm the only caterer that has a chocolate fountain in town, you're gonna pay this. Well, now when there's 10 of them, guess what? The price and everything changes, and the, you know, so it's really based on what the market will bear more than any margin. And hopefully, you can position yourself where you make a good margin of what you charge. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, it's almost one of those things that if you're going to get married, tell people like it's a funeral or something because then they'll feel sorry and charge you less. But when you say wedding, number one is they see bridezilla, higher disposable income, and you're dealing with the mother of the bride and the daughter and emotions and whatever. If you're dealing with a corporate person, it's like a five-minute conversation. Hey, I got another hundred people at the training center Friday. That's it. I mean, and they don't sweat you. They don't bother you. Same thing. I used to do uh, bar mitzvahs. I can say this because I'm Jewish. So if you're Jewish, don't be offended because I'm Jewish too. But whenever I did bar mitzvahs, the mothers would just sweat me so hard about, well, could we get a, I don't like this fork. Could we get another fork? Could we get this? And, you know, they call you like a hundred times. It's like, look, it's peanut butter sandwiches. Why are you bothering me? It's like, seriously. Go. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so we'll take one more and then we'll get back to the show and then another commercial break. Yep. Michael, what are your thoughts? Do you use an outside catering salesperson to go out and drum up business? 
We're going to talk about sales, and I've, I've done both. I've had a salesperson. Um, I did, about a year or two in, I brought in an operating partner, and I focused on going after whales, what I call the top 100. Um, um, so to answer your question, well, we'll talk about it now. So you could do one of two things. Are you a good salesperson? Yeah. Okay. Have you sold in a previous life? What did you sell? Okay, well, I hope you're not packing today and I'll piss you off. <laughs> and I'm not, in, I'm, I'm not in the market for a third engagement ring. Let's just get that out there. Um, I'm emotionally unavailable. Um, so to answer your question, no one is going to be a better salesperson of your business than you, right? You believe in what you're selling. You believe in your food, your staff, and if you don't, Fix it. Now, if you've never sold before, if you're an introvert and the thought of talking to somebody and having a string more than three words in a sentence, don't sell. But I'm a great salesperson, you're a great salesperson, so you're better off hiring somebody to do the low wage works you're, you're doing. So let me guess, if I go in there at lunch, are you making pizza? Are you answering the phones? Are you working in your business? Okay, how much can you replace yourself for? $15 an hour? Okay, we'll just, we'll use 15 because that's what everybody wants to charge for minimum wage. We'll just, we'll keep it simple, right? You're not going to get a good catering salesperson for $15 an hour, okay? You're better off saying, hey, I'm going to hire somebody for 20 hours a week to do this work for me, and I'm going to take those 20 hours, and I'm going to go after all the big offices, all the big events, and you're going to generate more sales, and you're going to get more fired up because now you gotta work in your operations, you gotta go out in the community, you get a build and they're working with the owner, there's nothing better than I'm dealing with the man himself. You know what I mean? So if you're a good salesperson, I would do that. And it's cheaper. And if you're not a good salesperson, hire a good salesperson. So let me tell you, the, you know what the biggest mistake people make in hiring a catering salesperson? Any guess, clue? Oh, well, okay, that's a little too broad, but yes, wrong person. Huh? Nope. A what? No, the biggest problem, okay, last, last guess. Um, you're, you win the prize, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand on that. I get this, I get this all the time. You know, I've got this hostess, and she's like, shows up on time, and she brushes her hair and her teeth, and I think she'd be really, really good to go out there and sell catering. And I'm like, okay, has she ever sold before? Well, no, but she's good. And so they think I can take that hostess at the hostess pay and teach her to be a sales rep. A pig in a dress is still a pig. You can't turn something into something that they're not. You're not a sales trainer. Unless your middle name is Zig Ziglar, you're not going to train them. So you're, 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 you're doing yourself a disservice, and then what happens six months later? This catering sales doesn't work. We can't sell catering. I don't know what you're talking about. You hire someone who has sold before. And so I, the smartest client I ever had he recruited away a salesperson from, sale, uh, from Jason's Deli and paid him really, really well. What do you think that got, got him? What? He had a Rolodex of people who order catering in their market. Well, you can have them sign non-competes and non-solicitations. But, so you're in Houston, right? If you had a guy that sold a million dollars worth of catering for Jason's Deli, what would he do for you? So literally overnight, this guy did, went from doing 1000 a month to 3000 a month in 30 days because he had a Rolodex. So you're going to invest. So let's do the math. Okay, we're going off script, but let's do the math. Do you grant me that... Incremental catering sales is worth 50 cents on the dollar. That's roughly what it works out. I've been doing this long enough. So let's just say that you're making the average profit in a restaurant's 5%. Let's be generous, it's 
I increased my sales by 20% in catering. Another 10%, I doubled my profit with catering. See it all the time. Did you have to go sign another lease? Did you have to buy another pizza oven? Did you have to hire another manager? Did you have to stock more, you know, double the inventory? So why does everybody tighten up at the thought of paying somebody 40 to 50,000 a year who's a baller salesperson? So I'm gonna give you a whole nother business for $50,000 a year, and oh my God. But you go spend, how much to go build a second location? 250, half a million, a million dollars? Do you see the absurdity in that? All of you should run out and go hire the best salesperson you can afford because if they're good, you're gonna make the same amount of money as expanding and opening up a second unit. You're not cut in half. You don't have to worry about, did I make a bad investment and the second store is gonna take down the first and the second. Uh, some of you have probably been there. So just think about that. Did that, did that help you? Good. Okay, farming. So if anybody's ever been in real estate or had a realtor send them flyers every month in the mail, what realtors do is they pick a neighborhood and every month they're sending out a direct mail piece that when you wanna buy or sell a house, you think about that realtor, you can do the same thing for catering. Probably the least effective, but it's also one of the easiest. So basically it's business to business. You get a list of people in your geography that you're willing to cater to. So that could be a zip code, it could be downtown, it could be a county, your whole city. Um, you wanna look for a certain number of employees, probably 10 to 15 minimum. Um, and then you wanna get the decision maker. Um, you're not gonna be able to buy a list of decision makers. So I would recommend that um, you have somebody call and clean the list. Most lists are not very good, so you need to clean them. You know, so maybe only half the names are really, really good, and then, and that's okay, it's sort of a, 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 a cost of acquiring a list. Um, and then you wanna contact a minimum of four to 10 times a year um, and just stay in front of them and change up the format. Um, you don't want to send the same flyer every single time because they get immune to it. And so this is something we did for um, Pizza Schmidza in uh, Chicago, I mean, uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, any questions about farming? Yes? Um, when you go to business to business, who do you target to, to have that assistance? The person who orders catering. You just, you just ask. Here's the script. No, 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 but to get the name, you have to call. Yeah. So what you would do is you'd have a list in Excel of all these businesses, right? 2,000 businesses in your trade area. You or somebody else is gonna call and say, hey, I need to mail something to the person in charge of ordering catering. Who should I send that to? Oh, Susie Jones handles that. So now you got the name, right? Well, we don't order catering. What do you mean you don't order? Oh, we're going out of business next week. Okay, well, you're not on my list. So, I mean, you're, go you're gonna find out bad number. Well, I'm not gonna send a bad number if I can't find them on the internet and get a good number. So all you're gonna do is clean the list. And if they don't have anybody, go, who's in charge of HR? That's the next place I would go. They'll tell you who orders catering. Everybody knows who's in charge of the food. That's a given. <clears throat> So let's talk about catering sales and sort of the next level besides more passive. Um, so the catering success formula is really simple. Qualified catering decision makers plus endless follow-up gets you success in catering. Um, and it's almost like, it's like dating. Anybody dated in here? Ever date, you know? Have we got any married people? Oh, y'all are married. Oh, your husband left you already. Oh my God. He left you in Vegas. You're supposed to get married in Vegas, not get left behind. So we got anybody married? Okay, y'all aren't married, but okay. So you're married. We'll put you on the spot because you're a guy. So how long have you been married to your wife? 11 years, congratulations. The first 50 is the toughest. Um, so do you remember your first, your, first, uh, your first date? Yeah, you called her up, said, hey, I'd like to take you out to dinner, you know, whatever. Um, and so you probably like washed your hair and like put 
something in it and you know like actually ironed her shirt like today you just like throw something on and it's like she yells at you I get it so you took her out you like open a car door for her now you know y'all are just running first person who can get into the rainstorm each man for himself I get it it changes and you know you probably told her funny stories at dinner and you won her over with your boyish good looks and charm and you know at the end of the date did you hand her a card and say hey I had a great time what's your wife's name Daisy. Hey, Daisy, I had a great time. Here's my card. If you want to get married, give me a call. <laughs> did the, is that how you did it? No. You had to put in effort. Like, you know, you had to actually, you know, you didn't call her the next day because that's like a little too eager. So you waited to the day after. You called her. You texted her. Hey, would you like to go out again? You know, you use an excuse. Hey, a buddy of mine's got some free tickets. So I was thinking, I've got no one to take. Would you like to go? Anyway, so you got to put in all this effort, right? Sales is the same thing. Do you think you just knock on a door and go, hey, I'm selling catering. Oh, I've been waiting for you for 10 years to come into my office. We've been starving in these meetings. Thank you. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. You have to court people, right? Because this is the deal. Even if you're pursuing a girl that has a boyfriend, which you shouldn't do, but maybe, you, maybe you're uh, on the peripheral, you know, like, like an orbiter, as my friend calls them, like you're checking in. Hey, how's it going? You still, what's your name? Charlie. You still with Charlie? Yeah, we got married. Okay, just checking in. And you know, <laughs> you know, and if you check in, what happens if you check in often enough to somebody, right? You catch them in a weak moment, like, oh yeah, Charlie, like, he didn't take out the trash, he's terrible. Well, you think you want to go out with me now? Yeah, sure, let's do that. So it's the same thing with caterers. You got a caterer that you love, but you know, if you catch them on the wrong day of the week where the caterer is late or they change people, now all of a sudden, Charlie's get, getting dumped and they're calling Michael. That's the way it works. So it's, it has to do with the follow-up. Uh, Somebody told me the fortune is in the follow-up and nobody follows up. So here's some, some stale sales statistics. 48% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. So you get the phone to ring and the salesperson doesn't bother. 25% of salespeople make a second contact and stop. 12% of salespeople make more than three contacts. Very few. 2% of sales are made on the first contact. 3% of sales are made on the second contact. 5% of sales are made on the third contact. 10% of sales are made on the fourth contact. 80% of sales are made on the 5th to 12th contact. What does that tell you? Did you have to take your wife out on 5 to 12 dates before you got her hooked? More or less, yeah. So it's the same thing. So if 12% of sales people make more than 3 contacts and 80% of sales are made on the 5th to 12th contact, then the odds aren't in your favor. So if you do nothing else but just follow up on a regular basis, email, call, visit it's all you know who the people are if you if you follow my advice i told him call who's in charge of ordering catering i got a list of 1500 people in my market and you follow up with them on a regular basis mail call email visit call email visit do you think at some point you're going to catch them on a cycle where they are tired of barbecue and they want italian food are they tired of their their, their current person because they keep dropping the ball that, that's the formula. Y'all can all go home now. It's it. That's it. That is a whole formula. So what's your first goal? Get them a sample luncheon. Is there anything better than sampling food? No. Not when it's free. Huh? Not when it's free. Not when it's free. So a couple of food sample stories. How many people go to Costco? That is my hobby. Costco is my hobby. And just as an aside, there is nothing better than the hot dog run through the pizza oven and blacken. That's the best. I mean, like, I would almost put that against the 22 course tasting last night when I'm hungry. I'm telling you, the Costco hot dog is like one of my favorite foods. So, statistic when grandma is sampling pizza at Costco, they sell 600% more pizza. That's a pretty good ROI. And then I'm going to tell you Michael Atias's story on sampling. How many people, again, this is probably like a yellow page, it's only half of you know, heard of world's finest chocolate covered almonds? 
they are phenomenal, right? I sold them in third grade. I sold more than anybody in the whole school. You know why? I bought a box and I'd knock on the door and I'd say, hey, I'm Michael Atias. I'm selling world's chocolate, world's finest chocolate cover items for my school. Here, try one. So one of two things happen. They loved them and they bought a box or they feel guilty and they bought a box. <laughs> I still made the sale. So what's going to happen is, hopefully your food's good. If your food sucks, then all you're going to do is waste everybody's time and money, right? But if your food's good, they're going to be prompted to say, hey, maybe I need to give them a shot. Or I feel guilty they came out and they fed 10 people in our conference room and the different people. Let's, let's give them a shot and see how they go. So f giving away food is like the best way. But it needs to be a qualified person, right? That's, that's very important. So um, this is sort of a process. Um, I call it a sales tempo. They're called cadences. They're called sequences. The, the thing in sales, when I was in sales, you would get a business directory. You would write contacts on an index card, and you would just smile and dial all day long. And that's very demoralizing. Now it's multi-step, multi-touch. So if you look, um, what we use is, uh, number one, you have to have the list of catering decision makers. Number two is we use direct mail to prime the pump, and we got phenomenal results on that. Number three is we follow up with the telephone. When you call after direct mail, you get up to a 300% better response rate. If I call you, you've never heard of me, it's cold call. If I call you and say, hey, I'm the guy who sent you postcards, did you get them? It's a warm call. So. Um, and cold calling sucks. Then LinkedIn, trying to connect with people on LinkedIn. And then the last, and a, a lot of people do this, I call it the cookie drop step. You show up with a tray of cookies at 2.30 in the afternoon, and you only give it to the decision maker. What happens at 2.30 in the afternoon in every office in America? You need two things. You need coffee, you need sugar. So when you show up with a tray of sugar, you can almost take a five pound sack of sugar and put it in a bowl. They're going to welcome you in front. And when they go, oh, well, I'll take that for Susie. No, 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 I can only leave it with the Susie. They're going to get Susie out of that meeting and say, look, Susie, they have got some mini cannolis, chocolate chip cookies, and brownies. You need to get yourself out of that meeting now because we're all hungry. And that's exactly what's going to happen. But don't do that as the first step. This is sort of like your last most expensive step. Because anytime you have to get in a car and go visit somebody and bring stuff, it's more expensive. So if we can use direct mail, phone, and LinkedIn, um, that's what we want to do to leverage. So the first generation of lead generation, of first generation of lead generation, we, um, my marketing director would hand address number 10 envelopes every Monday. We'd send three letters to somebody. So if you get a letter hand addressed to you, and it just has a return address and a cool stamp at an angle, and it's either blank, it says second notice, or third and final notice, what are the odds you're gonna open up that envelope? Pretty high. And then we put this lovely, ugly, laser printed letter in there. Um, we didn't have colors black and white back in the day. Um, and basically, we told the decision maker that they'd want a lunch for, for uh, six or eight or whatever you wanted to put in there, we got a 20 to 40% appointment rate. Does anybody get 20 to 40% return rate on direct mail? I hit in the right person with something that they're gonna open with a strong offer targeted to them. That's why direct mail can work. Not just a mass, let me just send out a flyer to everybody in my neighborhood. Um, I have a client in Boston and he, I mean, uh, Baltimore, and he's, he's done a take on this, different ones, um, and he gives 20% off his first order besides the tasting. Um, it's all, we talked about the list. I'm not going to go back over this, but if you have a bad list, you're not going to get good results. So you have to take somebody, this is where I see the biggest problem. Nobody takes the time to call the, the names and qualify the list. Bad names, bad results. Qualify, qualify, qualify. Find the decision maker, who orders catering, how often, and for how many people. That'll tell you if they're qualified for you, right? Um, send out postcards, telling you about the free tastings that you're gonna give away. 
Um, then after that, the phone step, um, and you can, I mean, I own a catering software company, you can do it automati automatically in our software, or just keep up with it in an Excel spreadsheet, and you can time what steps you need to do. You know, somebody might only target 25 new people a week, maybe it's 50 people a week. Um, LinkedIn, it's not the strongest step, but most of these catering decision makers have LinkedIn profiles, so why not connect with them and try to communicate that way with them? Um, and then the cookie drop, which is actually going out there, um, and your goal is to get a sample. I'm going to give you a little secret weapon when it comes to um, booking meetings. Um, does anybody have scheduling software that they send people to to set meetings with them? It's super cheap. I mean, it's built into our, our software, but it's you're going to pay $10 a month maybe. And there, there's a thing called friction. Anything that gets in the way of the sale being made is friction. So how many times have we, we had it where, where um, I call you up or email you and say, um, oh, would you like a free lunch, a sample luncheon at your office? Yes. Give me three dates and times you're available. Well, I'm available. Oh, I can't do that. How about these dates? No, I can't do that. And you go back and forth, right? It's ping pong. And what ends up happening? You lose them, right? But if somebody gives you a link to their calendar and say, hey, here's my calendar. Just pick a date and time that works for you, and we're done. So ever since we started doing that with our appointments in our business, in the software business, um, the amount of appointments we've set has greatly increased because there's no back and forth. No trying to get someone on the phone. How hard is it to get somebody on the phone to try to coordinate something like that? It's real difficult. So have something like this, a booking link that's hooked to your Gmail or your Outlook calendar that you can um, send people just a simple link. Um, let's talk about niche marketing. Um, I've got a saying, riches and niches. Um, and I use the example of doctors. At one point, every doctor was rich. Now they're not. Who are the doctors that are making money? Spe <laughs> the specialists. Did someone say proctologist? <laughs> well, I guess they didn't say OB and then the GYN, so we're okay. But anyway, the more specialized you are, the more money you can make. And same thing, like you're talking about booking weddings, right? Well, if you're the wedding catering specialist, you're going to make more money because you understand the niche and what have you. So you want to analyze your business to know what niches you're going after to go after more because you're never getting 100% of a niche. So here's some niches. Sports banquets. Any of y'all have kids that have played high school athletics? Oh, a lot of underachiever kids in the... I mean, come on. Yes. How many sports banquets have you gone to in your life? Yeah, and what are they feeding? 100, 200, 300 people? Who's getting that catering order? Why isn't it you? So the first year I sent out a letter to all the uh, athletic directors how you could avoid the 10 biggest mistakes made planning a sports banquet, and I ended up booking about $3,000 in sports banquet sales, and this is going back a long time. So they're booking from somebody. CPAs during tax prep time, what are they doing? They're bringing in food nights and weekends while they're doing all these returns. So I, I created a letter that looks like a 1040 tax form with a letter, put it in an envelope that says important tax document and close. You think that's going to get open in a CPA's office? Yes. I got a client in Miami. Um, first year he did this promotion, he booked $5,000 in drop-off catering. And every year it's worth five or $6,000 just sending out to a handful of CPA firms. Graduation parties, you know, my parents didn't throw me one when I got my GED, but most parents are going to throw a party. And um, that's a great opportunity to do drop-off catering, full-service catering. You can get a list of parents of high school seniors. You can go to high schools and network with them and do some stuff um, and um, get that. May should be slammed for you if you do a good job with that because there's tons of parties um, Black Friday, I found this one out by accident because I am a buyer, not a shopper. Didn't even know what Black Friday was in 1992. Um, had a major department store dealers order like for 250 people. And I called them up after the weekend. I go, I'm just out of curiosity. Why did y'all order all this food this past Friday after Thanksgiving? Because Black Friday, 
go, oh, okay. The next year, I put together a list of 45 major retailers. I booked $6,000 in drop-off catering. I expanded it. The best year I ever did was 12,000 in drop-off catering. We had five vehicles, and we just run back and forth to the different shopping areas in Nashville, and we made a ton of money. Um, um, bereavement meals. Um, now a lot of uh, funeral homes are actually they're 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 doing catering in the funeral home as a reception. People do meals for that. Um, we got any duck hunters in the room? Come on, I gotta have one duck hunter. One duck hunter. You know what Ducks Unlimited is, right? So in Tennessee, where we all walk around with duck calls and camo, um, Ducks Unlimited, they have a lot of chapters. Well, I was introduced to the guy over the Tennessee Ducks Unlimited, and he introduced me to all the chapter presidents, and we would go out and do a lot of their fundraising dinners. These guys are fun. You know, shotguns and alcohol is a great time. Um, and so they would spend a lot of money. We'd do ribs and barbecue and everything, and they'd have, you know, raffles and auctions and everything. It was good, good niche to get into. Hotels. There are a lot of hotels in your area that. Hold on, photo op. Ready? Okay. Thanks. You need my good side. So um, there's a lot of hotels in your area that have office, that have meeting space, but they don't have food, right? So we would network with some of those hotels that they would recommend us when there'd be a group in, right? They come in for an all-day meeting, they rent out a conference room, 10, 20, 30, 40 people. Well, why aren't you catering to those people? That's just like, that's super simple niche to go after. <coughs> and then this was my favorite. Anybody heard of Hospital Week? Every May, um, the hospitals will do something nice for their staff. So I created this uh, letter. Uh, actually, it was a different version, but you get the idea. Black background, white lettering. Help, you know, basically it was like, let us help uh, take care of your catering headaches. Get it? Headaches, catering. Um, print it on transparency film. Put it in a, um, a large uh, brown envelope so with x-ray film, do not bend. What do you think happens when you go to a hospital and you've got a package that says x-ray film, do not bend. Guy dies of a stroke. No, it opens up. And um, we booked over $17,000 worth of hospital week catering going after 20 hospitals. So there's a lot of really low-hanging fruit. So you can't use the fact you don't have money. Everybody can go, has a printer. Everybody can go buy transparency film. Everybody can knock this idea off because guess what? There are so many skull photos on Google Images to pick from, and then you send them out to the decision maker of the hospital and you call. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, here's something, um, uh, somebody taught me a trick. Um, you want to Google, uh, lunch will be provided Nashville, Tennessee, or your town. Lunch will be provided in the name of your city and state. Because there's a lot of meetings that are held and they, they advertise lunch will be provided. So if lunch will be provided, will you be providing the catering? And then pharmaceutical reps. I know some places farm reps have cut back, some they, they haven't cut back, um, but it's in a lot of places it's still a good niche. We created a mailing piece that looked look like a prescription pad. We put it in a cough syrup bottle and actually mailed out the cough syrup bottle. Mailing number two was actually an oversized pill bottle. Um, true story, and number three was a hypodermic needle that didn't do too well, so we had to scratch that one. Um, and I've got client after client that has done really well with that. But if you only had one thing that you were going to take away and do from here, it'd be the top 100. Focus on the 100 largest employers in your area. When I focus on Vanderbilt University and I get a 5,000 person picnic, I'm not gonna get that from a CPA firm that has 10 employees, right? It doesn't take much more to sell a big event as a small event, as long as you can handle logistically fulfilling the event. You know, I'm guessing with one pizza oven, you can't do 5,000 pizza, 5,000 people. 
So whatever that high number is for you, find employers that have that many employees. You're leaving before the fireworks? <laughs> um, so definitely go after that. The first year I went after the top 100, I booked over $45,000 in full service catering. And this is going back a lot of years. Um, here's another client that did really well with that. Um, so before we move on to other niches, um, uh, let's talk about any questions you have up, up till now. Yes? Very few. I mean, they just took the few. And then sometimes people will go, hey, we want to feed 15 people. Can we have eight for free and pay for the extra? And then sometimes someone says, I have nine, you know, yeah. Whoever the sales rep is, because it's a really, it's a person to person connection, right? You don't really, con you follow a company, but you don't yeah. connect. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So if if you have a great salesperson going out there and you know business, would it be awkward to then hand off that to a catering manager to organize it to share that same restaurant? Great question. So there's really two types of people. There are hunters and there are farmers. You want a hunter, somebody who's going to get out there and slay it, bring in new business, right? Um, they're really terrible at farming, attention to detail is bad, but they know how to close a business. So in a perfect world, you have the person who can go out there and just bring you business, and the person who can fulfill the business. So they're different people. Now if you have, if you tell me, hey, I do a half million dollars a year in catering, I'm not really looking to bring in a ton more catering, my operations max. You could hire a relationship person, pay them a little bit less, and their whole job is to take the catering orders, schmooze the people, check in with them, do that kind of thing. So um, they're just, they're different people. Now sometimes, I know some organizations, um, they do both, but they're really still not the cold calling type. You know, they might cold call once a week, but it's not, what they're really focused on. Any other questions? Yes? I have a question. So, like on our website, it says cater, but we prefer to take catering orders over the phone. So, we don't have people that, you know, search our area that are coming to the hospital and want to put in an order, and they'll call and say, my budget is, you know, $8,000. And I'll say, well, that's fine. Do you think that that would be Well, there's never right or wrong. There's just profit and no profit, right? So you have the packages because 90% of the people are going to fall under the packages, right? And if you have a low, mid, and high, you're taking care of the 90%. We, we had people all the time would come to us, look, I'm in charge of this field day at my kid's school. We're not going to spend X number of dollars for these kids. Could you put some together? And you could say, yeah, so we're going to do a slice of pizza, and whatever, and you put together a special package, but it's less food at a lower price. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and we do that, but I, I guess my question is more like, you know, do places prefer like a family style where you make them, you know, like bigger portions that people serve themselves, or do, do people in, in the catering business more benefit from just like individualized items, like a meal for a person is six dollars, or do you think it's better to say like well, people are coming to you to solve a problem, which is how many people, I've got 17 people to feed, so they want per person pricing, and you figure out how much food you need to send out to make sure they get fed. So I... Per person pricing is better. And doing like a buffet that, as opposed to individual meals. Because if you tried to box up a, you know, a hundred hot entrees, by the time you get halfway done, they're cold, right? So, um, you know, box lunches is a totally different thing. You can put a cold sandwich with a bag of chips or coleslaw or potato salad. Um, 
Now, there are people who do full service events that might do like a pasta station, right? You go out there and it's a pasta bar. Well, you're still charging per person, but you're making it each. Or when you roll up a pizza oven, you know, you probably have four or five pies and they're coming out of the oven and you're cutting them. Or if, you, if you're in a position to do that, you let people build their own pies. But um, does that answer your question? A little bit? <laughs> anyway, the answer is per person, per person and packages. Yes? Well, I mean, yeah, I got to, you know, that's up to you. I can't tell you your business model, right? Right. So the question is, is can you sell them something for $5 that you're happy to put your name on that's going to satisfy them? If the answer is yes, then go after it. If the answer is no, I, I, I have a Neapolitan pizzeria, everything's, you know imported this and imported that. No, you can't do it for $5 a person. But if you have a CC's Pizza franchise, you might say, yeah, I can. I mean, it has more to do with what you could do. I wouldn't drop my pants and give it away, but um, I, I'm not opposed to re putting together a different package and say, look, normally, you know, when we did barbecue, it was enough for one and a half sandwiches. For this price, I can only do one sandwich. You know? Yes? I'm going to tell you the number one secret of uh, selling more food or selling less food, like in a in a situation like that, smaller plates. So if you're really if somebody really pushes you up against the wall, use a smaller plate. Because what do we do when we go through a buffet? Like I'm like I haven't really had breakfast. Like I'm going to go hit the floor. And what do you do? You just load up a plate and you're going to eat all this food, right? When you go like if we had a buffet set up, which we're not. But if we did, we would just take that plate and we'd load it up with everything that could fit on that plate, right? Because our, we're, our eyes and our stomach are like, oh, I'm starving. And then when you're done with that plate of food, if you let it sit, you're not, most people aren't that hungry to go back a second time. Well, if I took a, this size plate versus this size plate, I'm going to put a third or half the amount of food on there you know it's still gonna fill up the person if they sit there and they're talking with people and they let it sit, settle in, right? So like you said, what I tell people is, normally let's say you would figure one sandwich a person on a sandwich tray. I said, well you could take a sandwich, cut it into quarters, and people are only gonna eat half or three quarters of a sandwich, right? Or if you cut it in half, some people are gonna take a half a sandwich, they might come back. The super, the guys, big guys like me are gonna come back and take a second half, and it's going to average out to three quarters. So there's a lot of psychology to how you package things, how you put them together, right? You know, you put more potato chips out and more coleslaw. You know, you put the meats and the sandwiches, expensive stuff at the end of the buffet so they fill up their plate with the least expensive stuff. So there's a lot of, psych a lot of psychology to that. Yes? Sales. 
So one is um, a farmer. A farmer tends to the crops, takes care of things. A hunter goes out, going to kill that deer, bring it back, and feed everybody, right? So it's somebody who'd probably, if you've ever been to a business, a retail store, where somebody has, whether it's a hostess, a server, a retail clerk that is really taking care of you, right? Where you walk out and go, man, I have never been taken care of so well, right? It's a nurturing personality. And that's more the profile of the person who might exist in that operation. They might. Like you might have a key person that is just really, really good with people. You know, they're going to be slightly codependent like myself. Um, no, no, let's call it what it is, right? You know, they're not narcissistic. They're more, the salesperson, the hunter is more narcissistic. The farmer is more codependent. And, you know, they want to take care of people. They, they're a people pleaser, right? They want to make people happy. So it's not about I'm making the most amount of money. It's the praise like, oh, Susie, every time you make me look like a hero, you're my favorite person. They thrive off of that. We all know people like that, right? They care more about appreciation than another dollar an hour. So let's, um, we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do, but well, let's talk roughly. So one of the things you can do is you can call the day before the order to confirm the order, right? What's your name? Hey, Bill, got an order tomorrow, uh, our deluxe uh, pizza and pasta buffet for 25 people. We still on for 1130 tomorrow. Just say yes. Role play. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I see, Bill, that you did get our uh, mini cannoli tray, but you didn't get the drinks. Would you like me to go ahead and add our drink pack? It's only $1.79 a guest. It includes uh, two glasses of beverage. We have lemonade, we have tea, we have uh, unsweetened tea, sweet tea, and peach tea. And that's going to keep you from having to go to the store and lug back two liters and deal with ice and cups in a mess. For $1.79, would you like us to go ahead and add that to your order? Cool. Okay. So there's a there's an upsell opportunity when you call people back, right? And there's also an opportunity that if somebody meant to cancel, don't you want to know before you show, oh, well, I called and canceled. Who'd you talk to? I don't know. Person on the phone. You know, they're, they're lying. They forgot to cancel and they don't want you to charge them for it. Okay. They're not always lying, but sometimes they're lying. Um, then you could call them afterwards. Hey, Bill, how was your how was your order yesterday? It was great. You know, anything we could do better? Um, no, everybody loved it. Hey, when's your, when's your next event? Can we go ahead and get that on the books? Oh yeah, I happen to have a training session two weeks from now. Awesome. So you can follow up on that. You can follow up that if you say I don't have anything now. When do you want me to call you back? Call me back in three weeks. You can put it in the in the in your database. Follow up in three weeks. Hey, Bill, this is Michael. Um, just checking in with you. you. Got any events coming up? You know, we did your event about a month ago. You asked me to follow back up. But yeah, we have something coming up in a week or, you know, whatever. You can also do, does anybody do um, anniversary reminders, rebooking? So you do a big event for 300 people. Don't you want it next year? You can put it in a file folder. So what I would do is I'd have a, a January through December folder. And if I had a big event, I would put it in the folder for the month or the month I needed to contact them, so you might go two months before or three months before, say, hey, we did your company party last year, want to get you on the books, can we talk about you doing your holiday party? Because a lot of people don't bother to rebook an event when it ends up happening. Somebody else gets hold of them, they forget about you. So you see how there's all these customer service type of things. Hey, it's your birthday, want to call and wish you a happy birthday. Why don't you come out of the restaurant, I want to buy you lunch. I'll send you a gift, gift card. So there's all these things that you can do Yes. If it's a drop-off catering, I don't get into that. It's not. It's not worth it. You know. Um, you. You know. I, I. You know. It happens so rarely. In the grand scheme of life, it wasn't worth it. And to get a deposit and sign a contract, it's too much work. Now, if it's a full-service event, I would get a non-refundable deposit to hold the date, but. I don't think you can call it deposit because it has to be um, returned. I think technically you have to call it a booking fee, and then that way you can keep it. Um, and then you have different mile markers, you know, that they have to hit.
Any other questions? Okay, um, bridal shows. Um, that's a great way to find thousands of irrational, um, <laughs> rabid buyers that only think they're getting married once. Um, and um, so whether you do weddings or rehearsal dinners, um, if, if that's your niche, um, you wanna go out there and set up a nice display um, this was done years ago before you could get nice banners done at a quick sign place. But what we would do is we would go out there and serve food and we would do a drawing. Now the drawing was for a $250 gift certificate for your rehearsal dinner or it could be for a wedding or something else. You don't want to give away a TV set because everyone will register for a TV set. And again, if you're going to lead generate, you want qualified leads, you don't want leads. I don't want to sort through the thousand names at a bridal show. I want the 200 brides that tell me that they want my gift certificate for the rehearsal dinner and will tell me when they're getting married, how many people, and all that information. So I could do five times the marketing and follow up with 200 people as opposed to 1,000. So any time that you have a chance to collect names, qualify, qualify, qualify. You want to make sure that I'm dealing with the bride who's going who's not eloping, I'm not dealing with a bride that has no budget and they're gonna go to KFC in grandma's backyard, that's not my prospect. Then again, I'm not dealing with the, the bride who's going to the country club and they're gonna write a big fat check there as well. So you, you wanna know who your, who your buyer is. Yes? Um, well, you can, you don't need to go to a bridal show to talk to a wedding planner. You can just get a list of the wedding planners in your area and say, hey, I want to take you out to lunch. I want to let you know what we do and see if there's a fit to work with our clients. Um, number one, uh, bri I, one of my friends is like one of the top bridal planners in the country. She only does really high-end events. So if you're not a super high-end caterer where you're charging ridiculous amount of money, a, bri a bridal planner is not going to deal with like a $15 a head barbecue buffet, right? That's a bride's gonna do that, a bride and her mother or her best friend. But if you do offer catering at a level that a bridal planner would wanna work with you, then go to them as well. But you're hitting all these brides in one place. That's the advantage, as opposed to trying to find them onesie twosie. They're all, show, you know, they're all showing up at the trough, right? You can, you can address them all at once. Yes, anybody else? Um, joint ventures, you know, there are people, we talked about hotels could send you business. Um, we actually put together a picnic open house with a YMCA camp that had a great facility, a guy that did inflatables and games, one guy that did balloons and face paintings and clowns, and um, all of us brought our list together, plus a prospect list, and it was like the ultimate company picnic and we we book some events there so you might I've, I've got a lot of clients that do open houses whether you go to the bridal show and you collect the name of brides and say hey three weeks tonight we're gonna have uh, 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 an open house and you can sample of all of our food so now you get 20 brides to come and you don't have to feed them one at a time um, or you might do a holiday party open house want to showcase the different things we're doing for the holidays come have lunch with us try to book so um, there's a lot of things you can do there. Um, referrals, any time that you can get referrals, um, that's low-hanging fruit. So where, where are you going to go? Number one, when you work with a big company, there are other decision makers in that company that order in catering, right? So if you're in the account HR department, I might thank you for your business and say, who else in your company orders? Oh, well, Stephanie in accounting does. Um, Bob in marketing does a lot of events, the person in charge of our training department, we have a training class that comes through here every week and they're doing, doing events. So try to get introduced that way. Um, you can reward people for referrals. Um, we have that built in our software or you can have your own program. The other thing a friend of mine taught me which is a great idea, when you say, hey, who do you know that orders catering, what do most people say? I don't know, let me think about it. You sort of put him on the spot, right? So what my friend does, when he tries to get business for, for himself, he puts together a list of the businesses he wants to work with. So you could take your list of prospects, 
say, hey, here are the com you know, Susie, here's a we appreciate your business and you know we value any referrals that you could give us. Here's a list of clients in Nashville we would want to work with. If you have any connections at this company, would you mind highlighting the list? And I'll call you back in a week or two, and I, I would love it if we could go over it and you could make some introductions. So now you're not asking them to think of who they know. They're like, oh, Nissan, oh, one of my best friends works at Nissan and I could help you that way. Or one of my friends works at Vanderbilt. Or one of my friends works at a doctor's office and they order in lunch all the time. So um, that's a great, great strategy. Then um, we have um, lead capture. Um, it's important that any prospect get into your database. Because like we talked about the fortunes and the follow-up, maybe they buy from DU today. There have been times that I've quoted proposals and I didn't get them for three years. I, I can't tell you how valuable the follow-up is. If they're a buyer, they're a buyer, they're a buyer. They might not buy from you today. They might not be buy from you tomorrow. But if you stay after them, you've got a shot. Um, so you want to put them in a CRM. That's really important to have a database that you can work with. Um, and then... Um, you want to have a way to capture leads off your internet, like a catering inquiry form that feeds into your database, that automates the follow-up, like sends them an automated email, you get an email. Um, little fact, when you get a lead, how many people get leads off the internet like a form? How long do you wait to call them? Who said that? I, yep, zero seconds, okay. Within 24 hours. Okay, you need to call them back in the next five minutes if you can. They've done studies. Think about this: when you're searching online for something, right, you are hot and bothered to scratch that itch. Not that hot and bothered. I mean, like catering hot and bothered. So, you know, when you're in buyer mode, you're in buyer mode, right? So. You're not the only person I'm filling out a form for, right? Three other people. Well, you wait 24 hours to call me, I might have already bought from somebody else. So they've done studies that the, the closer to the time that they filled out the form, you want to you want to pick up the phone and call them because you've got a better shot at turning them into a customer. So that's one of the things that you should do. Another thing is um, you should answer your phones live. And if not, have them forwarded to someone who can answer them live and say, Susan's in a meeting, I'll have her call you right back. Because I can't tell you how many mystery shop projects I've done. How many mystery shop projects I've done for people. And um, you, are you in level 12 or 13? <laughs> Let's call her back so she can find it. No, I'm just joking. Y'all have been a great group. You know, tip your waiters and bartenders today. They work hard for you. Um, so um, you want to make sure the right person's answering the phone that can either help them. Never say, oh, let me give you Susie's number. You can call her. No, you take that name and address and you call your cater. I mean, name and phone number, you call the catering salesperson. You know, Beth just called up interested in a wedding and you call them right away. Never make them do the work. And if somebody answers the phone, you know, can't answer the phone, then you forward it to somebody who says, She's in a meeting, she'll call you right back, and then you get a text or something, and you get back with them quickly. Because the people who don't get the catering, like I'm guessing you said you did it over half a million. My guess is if I called you, someone's gonna answer the phone that can help me, and I'm not gonna get shuffled around on a voicemail or something. Yeah, I've done mystery shopping in groups like this, and it's pretty interesting to see how the phones are answered. But if you're doing half a million, you can't be half, half doing it halfway. Because people expect they're going to call and get them. Just like if you do pizza delivery, are they going to, are they going to be happy if, if nobody answers the phone? No, they're going to go someplace else. Courting your leads. We talked about um, how to win somebody over. Um, you want to stay in front of them. Uh, a newsletter, emails to your prospect list, um, seasonal mailings. You know, do you have a special holiday menu or just a promotion? Um, this is one, this is very really cute. Um, um, you want to communicate to close the catering. So the biggest mistake that I find is you've got the wrong person answering the phone. 
So, um, you like that meme? So, this is an actual, a client of mine that was a franchisor had me mystery shop all his franchisees, and this is an actual owner of a franchise store that I called to order a catering. Okay, so you've got a big client you're flying into town to feed. I call this person and he says, oh, noon, you know, that's a little busy time of day, you know. <laughs> Think you could do that lunch at 3 o'clock when things slow down? <laughs> you know, I've heard of this new diet. If you only eat six hours out of the day, you'll lose weight. So your people lose weight. We'll be able to accommodate you. It's win-win for everybody. So, and, and you know, look, we could literally, I could do a whole mystery shop like, improv all day long and you'll have people doing things like that. What person in the catering business is going to say, noon's the busiest time of day, I don't know if we can do it. Well, but you know, I thought about it, yeah, what the heck, shut down the restaurant to deliver your catering, it all works out the same. <laughs> Probably sell more catering than we will in the restaurant. So you want to make sure whoever's talking to the customer and it, Try, try, try never to say no. You know, hey, I can take care of this last minute. I can't get you lasagna, but I can do baked ziti. You know, I can do this for you. Hey, can we push it back to 12.15? We're booked up. Or can I push it up to 11.45? Try not to say no, because then they're going to someplace else and they're not going to come back. Yes? So what's the problem? So I, I happened to bring in sound an hour and a half early because there was one catering and it seemed like that kind of thing was happening in the world. Is that a dangerous thing? Well, no, no, no. I'm going to tell you the, the flaw, the, the, the flaw in, the, in the logic. You need to get more catering that you can justify having people in an hour and a half early every single day, right? Not that, oh, you know, Santa Claus came to town once a year, right? You want it that every day you have two, three, four, five drop-off caterings on the books where well, you need to do it. And guess what? You're going to have to fake it till you make it. If you want to be in the catering business, you've got to be available. You can't say, well, we've got no caterings on Thursday. Hey, uh, Bob, could we reschedule Friday? You know, nobody else booked for that day, and you're going to have to call somebody else. I mean, you're in the business or you're not in the business. So same thing, do you staff your, you got a pizzeria? Okay, Friday night, you have a staff? No, I mean, seriously. I mean, I, I walk in, you're going to be able to serve me pizza? There's a, you know, and guess what? Monday night, are you open? Okay, are you doing the same on a Monday night as a Friday night? Uh, but you still got the staff, and you still got the lights on, and you still got the, the pizza oven going, right? Yeah, but when you open has no bearing on what they want. They're their customer. So I, I accommodate. Look, I've done graveyard shifts where people go, hey, we're going to give you a catering for 700 people, but we need you to feed 25 people in the middle of the night. Well, cost-wise, it doesn't make sense, but the fact that they're giving me all this business, I'll send two dudes out to feed 25 people because it's all built into my profit, right? So if that's what they want, and if you don't want to do it, then don't do it, and then you're taking the chance that they won't use you. So the real answer is sell more. Sales cures a lot of evils. So now, if you were doing five orders every single day, you could bring people in early, and you're going to find with corporate drop-off, a lot of times people want it before you open the doors, right? They want it delivered early. So I don't mean to be beating you up, but it's like everything's a sales problem. You just sell more, it solves everything. Yeah. No, 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 no. You don't have to. 
Are you married? No, 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 but you're married, right? Yeah, every problem in your marriage is a sales problem. I want to go on vacation. And she's telling you some more pizza. I, right? It's a sales problem. That's why this room is filled. We're not talking about gluten-free cookie options in here, right? Well, I wouldn't have three people. Now I'm going to piss off a gluten-free person in here. <laughs> yes. Are you gluten-free? Hold on, hold on. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. We're going to a seminar later on millennials and how to get what you want. Oh, you know how hard it is to get to disclosure. Why do you think I sold my restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. So we're talking about having a business where the availability has to be very flexible, um, the income is, has to be very non determined. So, okay, so it's sort of like you need to learn the tricks of the trade, right? So let's talk about the tricks of the trade, okay? We're going to talk about drop-off catering, okay? Those of you who do drop-off catering, you're running your restaurant anyway, right? You got to open up, you got to prep for lunch, right? So you're going to tell me that the people are in there prepping, if they do prep the day before, like pre-prep some stuff, right, that they can't throw that in the mix of what they're doing to get a couple of orders out. Produce the orders, right? Just like pan of lasagnas, four pizzas, pan of salad, breadsticks. Your team could probably do that most weekdays before lunch, right? Okay, mostly. I mean, look, I know it's not perfect. You know what, if you have a day you get 10 catering orders and you bring someone in, you pay them extra, a manager comes in until it becomes a problem every day, but that's how most of us do it, right? Is that pretty much what you're doing, you're working it in, you do as much prep the day before, in the, in the afternoon when it's slow. But if you don't have enough employees to bring in, they need to bring in four employees, and you've got two that Okay, now I'm confused. You open your restaurant, right? How many people do you need to run your restaurant? Uh, yeah. Two. Okay, well, can those guys not make, do a little prep in the afternoon when things are slow? That's a good problem. Right. To help you prep the, are we talking drop off or full service? We're talking drop off. Okay, so I guess I'm confused. Your current staff should be, how many drop off caterings are you doing a day? So you're doing one a day. So you're going to tell me that your employees cannot prep one drop off catering a day? Okay, well, okay, we're getting different numbers. This is like, Oh my God, this is like ex-wife number two. Let's start all over again. Okay, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have one a day and 10 a day. Okay, well, until you get 10 a day, why are you trying to solve a problem you don't have? Oh my God, but you're not over-promising. You have one a day. A busy day for you would be two a day, right? Yeah, it's like, look, so this is the deal. You should have enough staff or go in yourself. I mean, there's other people, management, whatever, and help prep if it's a busy day until you get to a, most people have a steady amount of business most days of the week. 
that you're staffed for, right? You're doing half a million dollars a year. Well, at some point you said, I probably need to bring in another prep person to help prep for these caterings, or maybe it's two people a day. There's a number. Well, right now you're not doing 10 a day. You're nowhere close to 10 a day. So, oh my God, I could win the Powerball lottery tomorrow. No, 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 really, I could. I've got a better odds. Okay, to hire more people, just like you hire regular employees. But, but you're right now. Hmm. How are you I don't know. I mean, where are you located? Okay. Well, I don't know the pay rate of all 50 states and every municipality. You pay what the market costs. If it takes $15 an hour, it's 15 bucks an hour. If you're in Tupelo, Mississippi, it's minimum wage because it's Tupelo, Mississippi. You know. Not, not hating on Tupelo, Mississippi. It depends on where you're located. Hold on, let me, let me just get to this. So you don't have an operational problem putting together the pans of pasta. Let me get the second half, which is delivering the food. So this is super simple. Um, you have on-call delivery drivers. You have retirees. You have stay-at-home moms. You have school teachers on break. I had a whole courier service, and that's all they would hire. And you just call the people when you need them. And mom can go out, deliver, make a tip, make 25 bucks. She's not gonna make, she's not gonna go to Walmart to go make that 25 bucks. She wants to come in, do a delivery, and then go pick up her kids, maybe two deliveries. So delivery drivers are like a dime a dozen, huh? They're a dime a dozen. When you get busy enough that you get tired of coming into the restaurant every morning to help, and work double shifts, then you'll go hire someone to take care of it. Before that, you have a sales problem. You don't have an employee problem. Get, get, go out and get the sales, and then you'll go hire more employees. Like, is that your husband in the car business? Okay, you didn't hire 10 salespeople to sell cars before you were selling enough cars to need 10 salespeople, right? It, it's a, you're putting the cart before the horse. If you were my business partner, I go. We're, we're not going to invest in people to sit around for this hypothetical ten orders that we're so far from getting. Let's worry about getting two a day and see how we can manage that. Because if you prep before and you prep, maybe you have to bring your guys in an extra hour early. Maybe you share the tips with them. You know, there's ways you can deploy your current assets. Maybe the man, here's something. You know, maybe the shift manager rolls up his sleeves and helps prep the order. I mean. You know, when it was barbecue, it was super simple to put together an order. You know, because if a customer called you up out of the blue and said, hey, I need 20 pizzas at 11 o'clock when you open, are you going to say, we don't have enough people? You're going to make the pizzas. So I, I don't mean to be beating up on you. Okay, are y'all both in there every day? Plus two employees? Oh, four of you should be able to knock out four orders, no sweat. We're also doing a million dollars a year in sales, which is what we do. Well, I mean, that's, that's healthy. Then, okay, then invest in one more person if you think you need one person. But I don't think you're doing enough catering to justify another person. Again, that's my perception. I'm not in your operation. If you feel you need it, then invest. If you're doing a million, then you should have the profit so you can bring in another person and maybe just say, look, I need somebody to come in from nine to three and just do catering prep before and at, you know prepping for the, the day of preparing and then doing prep for the next day but again if you're only doing one catering I don't think that justifies that investment but I don't know I'm not I'm not buried in your operation then maybe you find some some on-call people that you can call in You recruit them, you, you, you know, it's like everybody else. We all have to go through a lot of applications to get good people. But you also want to be the type of place that I want to come to work for. So think about fast food. If I say, and, and this is no disrespect against fast food, if I said, typical person who works at a McDonald's counter, does that make you feel warm and fuzzy? Okay, if I say Burger King, warm and fuzzy? What if I say Chick-fil-A? No, I mean, they've got the best fast food employees in the world. My pleasure. Thank you for coming. 
Um, if I had a teenager, I'd have them go to Chick-fil-A for the values that they teach. Well, how do they recruit all these great people? Well, they're closed on Sunday, so if I'm a Christian parent, I want my kids off on Sunday to go to church with me, so that's a big advantage. And I'm not making a religious, this is not a, I'm Jewish, so I'm definitely not proselytizing here. But they, they have created their own source of people because all these youth pastors are going to say, go to Chick-fil-A. They, they have a good, wholesome environment for the kids. They teach them life skills. So everybody has the same opportunity to recruit good people. They have a culture that attracts good people. So that's part of it, is what can you do to attract better people than the next person? Okay, yes. Great. I mean, we don't need to schedule like three drivers, five drivers every day, but uh, you know, it's nice to have a list. And especially with uh, the way things are going, people don't want to, uh, they don't want to commit to a job the way they have to come in. But it, if you have a list of those nice guys that come in to pick up food, it, yep. think, you know, it seems like a really nice guy. And okay. I want to, we've got more stuff to cover, like the big reveal. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> So, um, turning customers and clients, cor- make sure the order's correct. Nothing can be left off of an order. Make sure you deliver on time. Friendly payments, we talk about terms, and thank you notes. There's nothing better than a thank you note. Handwritten is the best. Um, monthly mailers, you want to send people out. Um, uh, birthday program, telling your best customers happy birthday and sending them a gift certificate or gift card. Um, a loyalty program, those are becoming huge, um, rewarding people for their business. Client reactivation, do you have a system to go after people who have who've stopped ordering from you in 30, 60, 90 days? You need to have that because the most expensive sale you'll make is the first one. Every other sale is easier if you can keep a customer, so you don't want to lose somebody you've worked hard to get. Um, I want you... You can. We're, we're, we don't have the time to really do this exercise, but I want you to think about what is the highest return on investment idea that you're walking away, away from here. What are the top three ideas that you can take, easily implement, and profit from? I've given you a ton. Um, number two is when I first started um, and I wanted to sell, I didn't have a lot of time, so every afternoon for an hour I would just go unplug and sell. Everybody's got an hour in the afternoon, so what can you do to free up four hours a week? Number one, reduce, eliminate minimum wage job, delegate some of the stuff you're doing to others, um, set goals, and time block. Make an appointment with yourself every day from 2.30 to 3.30, I'm gonna go to Starbucks, I'm gonna turn off my phone, I'm gonna work on how to build catering sales. Um, And you need to be consistent. What I found is, it's sort of like January weight loss, everybody signs up, and come, you know, Valentine's candy, they're all off the wagon. So you're better off saying, I've got four hours a week for 50 weeks, and you put in 200 hours, then you're gonna go crazy for two weeks and put in 40 hours, and then you never do anything. It's about consistency. Final step, commit to your first marketing idea. Um, Time block four hours a week. Break down each idea into steps. Um, Make sure that there's a due date and responsible party for that. Um, If you go to my website, caterzen.com, I have six books you can get. My most popular are Cater or Die and Catering Multipliers. Um, So caterzen.com, bring out your phones, get on there right now, sign up. There's six great books, one on how to build uh, drink sales, one about websites. Um, I don't know the other ones. Um, I, I really don't. Huh? I'm too prolific. Um, My favorite quote is, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. Um, Benjamin Franklin, 
So I hope that y'all have come to my session and you're gonna do one thing differently. I've inspired you to do one thing that you weren't doing before you came in here to help sell more catering, operate a more uh, profitable uh, uh, catering um, profit center. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions and I'll stay as long as anyone asks, uh, wants to come up here. Yes. Usually a catering menu. I mean, you know, the more money you have, you can put together a nice folder, but you know, minimum a nice catering menu. Do we have, uh, is anybody handing out surveys in here? Okay, well, they didn't give me any. So I guess I don't get rated. Yes. What uh, catering is your offer? Cater is my company. It's got a lot of bells and whistles. I'm not supposed to give a big plug, but caterzen.com. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, the, the two books that I saw will have pretty much uh, examples that we saw in here, and it goes back over that. It's just a book. one of them talks about menus for specific catering companies. Do you, do you have anything like that? Well, not a specific catering company, just catering menus, like what we've talked about today. So basically, everything I've talked about today is encapsulated in my Cater or Die book, or the um, um, Catering Multipliers book. And it's a quick read. I mean, it, you know, it's... Huh? It's not 400. Pages. No, 3.99. You're good. <laughs> Big pictures, you know. See Bob, see Bob Cater, see Bob Cater down. You know, pretty easy read. Yeah. Um, you um, if you go to resources and ebooks. Is it on Amazon? Uh, it is. You can uh, contribute to my. Um, Costco hot dog funds because that's about my royalty check every month. Yes. Ask these guys. I don't know. I don't know that you're going to, huh? Yeah, mobile oven. I don't know that you're going to deliver hot and crispy pizza. And I don't think people. I don't think the expectation is it's going to be hot and crispy. It's just going to be hot pizza. It's not the same as eating in a dining room. Yes? Um, when I had my restaurant, tipping was optional and the person did it. I will tell you we have a delivery driver app that you can route deliveries. And when the driver goes to the customer, they have to approve the order and they're, they're given a pop-up. Do they want to leave a tip? I've got a, a client in Boston. They do $2 million a year, so the big corporate caterer. I've generated over $2,000 a month in extra tips for her staff. So my software has generated $24,000 in free payroll just for a button that somebody has to press. Cater Zen has that as one of the features, yes. And, and it routes the drivers, and the customer knows where the driver is in real time, so they're not calling you to say, where's my order? they get to see like an Uber driver where the driver is. It's pretty cool. Yes? It's software as a service, so we're all, always backing it up, maintaining it, adding on to the software, it never ends. So ongoing training support, everything else. Yes? I, I am not in the legal accounting or insurance business, so you need to check with your insurance agent. But you definitely want to be protected. Yep. Yes? Um, no, because it's proprietary, but just about everything in here is in the book. It's just, this is a slide deck of the book, and it's a quick read, and you'll see all the examples and everything else. Yes? Um, we have a sales journal report you can give to your bookkeeper to put in there. It's pretty simple. Um, okay, thank you. I'd appreciate a good rating, and if not, use the uh, Artisanal Bakers app or whatever is down there. 
Guys, I'll stay up here and answer questions as long as you like. Thank you so much for coming out.